we're we're about ready. Um, so we'll convene the meeting at 6:30. Focus of tonight's meeting actually is twofold. Um, the first part of the meeting is time for a conversation with our legislature, legislators, um, as well as the Vermont School Board Association and, and our school board. Um, the second part of the meeting has to do with uh, reorganize, reorganizing the school board um, after the recent town elections. Um, before we get started, however, do we have anyone who's willing to do the board assessment or evaluation? I contact works. <laughs> I was diverting my <laughs> All right. So I invite uh, Jeff and Nicole uh, to come on up if you'd like um, and begin our conversation. We also have uh, Ben and Jay here, our local legislators. We, we can probably speak from here so that we're all included in sure. the. Um, if this is a similar pattern to prior years, even though it's a conversation with legislators, neither of these gentlemen are on the Education Committee. So they'll look to us probably. I'm sure they are tracking the issues in Montpelier, but um, I think, is it health care and forest and agriculture? Ag and forest, yeah. Right. So um, let me say this. It's, a, it's always a pleasure to come and meet with you. This is probably the sixth or seventh year, I think. Um, every year we look for a session, legislative session that's less dynamic around education issues and it never is. Um, and this year, despite our call for sort of let's implement Act 46, which you all are uh, ahead of, um, um, we are looking at major education policy initiatives, particularly in the areas of funding. So um, I came from the House Education Committee today where the, there is a bill, H-911, which would um, rewrite the education funding formula. Um, and we can give you a little bit of detail on that. There's a bill that would um, change the way we fund special education to a census block model, um, which uh, I think is quite appealing to education officials and leaders at every level because it promises to um, less in administrative requirements and give more flexibility in terms of how dollars are utilized within the schools. Um, there is a, um, uh, a piece of legislation which is intended to um, modify the implementation of Act 166, which is the universal pre-K law that's been in place for a couple of years, which I would say, based on my observations, is not being um, implemented as well as we hoped it would. That's a bill that features both a mixed delivery model for pre-K kids, um, private settings and public schools, um, and also relies on the Agency of Human Services and the a Agency of Education to administer that law. I think that um, there's been some complications with regard to the legislation, its implementation that the General Assembly um, wants to work on. Um, what are, Nicole, what are some of the other major pieces that we're working with right now? Um, hi, everybody. <laughs> so I'm with the School Boards Association. I believe there's a couple of new school board members on your board. And so a lot of what we're covering, um, as soon as we get your email information, you'll start to receive our legislative reports. Um, so um, I think some of you on the board may be fairly familiar with some of these issues because we just sent out a, a report um, at the end of last week. But um, in addition to the bills that um, Jeff was talking about, the Senate Education Committee also um, <clears throat> moved forward a bill that would require independent schools that accept public dollars to serve um, students with disabilities if an IEP team determines that that school is the appropriate placement. Um, which is something that we have uh, as organizations really um, pushed for in terms of equal access uh, to students, uh, um, for students with disabilities to access the same educational opportunities that our non-disabled peers have. However, the bill ha has some, needs some more work because um, the current version says that if an independent school does not have the staffing resources to serve a 
particular child um, that the LEA has to um, staff that school. And um, so hiring, um, supervision, et cetera, would all be done by the LEA. So we what's have the, some, what's the LEA in the local? The local education agency. So it's usually the super, school district <coughs> or supervisory union. Yeah. Um, thank you. So they would do that for the private school then? Yes. That so so it's a time limited obligation. So um, the, the private school would need to obtain the resources necessary, including a licensed educator, special educator, and other resources um, within the school year that the student is first enrolled. Um, the, law also, the bill also doesn't include the kinds of protections we were seeking in terms of open enrollment processes so that all students can access um, and due process requirements. So a lot of the concerns we've heard from folks in the field have had to do less with um, enrollment and more with once a child is enrolled, if he or she exhibits behaviors that are not um, consistent with the expectations of the school, they are often um, asked to leave and without due process. So we've been asking for um, those protections. So it'll it's likely to pass the Senate and then it'll move to the House Education Committee for further review and tweaks. Um, mandatory radon testing is another issue we've been following. The Senate Education Committee um, moved from uh, requiring uh, radon testing to a, a committee that would explore funding for radon mitigation. We've had a couple of in, uh, uh, instances of schools testing positive for radon and um, we're interested in um, uh, working with the Department of Health and making sure that you know schools are safe. But if um, the state has an interest in pushing for the testing, then it ought to ensure that there are resources in place to support mitigation efforts. Um, and then the last bill um, is early, being you know in early stages of consideration, and that is. Um, ethnic uh, and social equity standards in schools. And so this would require um, two things. One, new standards for, um, for schools to adopt relative to um, ethnic and social equity, and a policy um, that would uh, um, seek to address issues around implicit bias and equity in schools. And um, so I'm not exactly clear where the House Education Committee is going to go with that. We have some um, believe that there are some current things in place, like the harassment and bullying policy that could be improved so that we don't have a whole other sort of construct and policy for dealing with some, some issues um, uh, through policy. And then, you know, how can the state board improve improve its standards process to address some of the current concerns that have been raised. So that's a work in progress. I'm not exactly sure where that will end up, but there's definitely a lot of support in the building for doing something with that bill. Anything going on with any gun legislation as it pertains to schools? Um, there's definitely um, movement on gun legislation, but it's primarily in the areas of universal background check or um, allowing the court to issue an extreme risk protection order. So it's less school specific. Um, the activity in schools is being directed by the administration who has um, uh, said that in the month of March every school will have a safety assessment conducted by county or local law enforcement. So a communication went out to your administrators, um, sort of giving you all the heads up that you will be contacted. I don't know if that's happened yet. Yep. Um, but they, they're trying to move that process forward and then identify, based on those assessments, what the needs might be um, for schools around the state. I would just add that the gun debate is extremely fluid. So a ton of details have not been hammered out yet. Um, 
we got a ton of stuff from the Senate that's coming over this week to the House side, and I know that there's going to be um, a lot of pressure to get something out, but the shape of it is still very much up, um, up in the air. So I think not right now there's a discussion around education, what happens in schools, but it's hard to predict what will happen in the next week or two around where this debate goes, because I think it could go a number of different ways. I understand that there's a nationwide student walkout scheduled for tomorrow. Um, tomorrow, Wednesday. the 14th. Oh, no. So Wednesday. Wednesday. So there's a, there's a, um, there's actually like three or four different coming up this month. Yeah, there's several. And the one, the earliest one is um, this Wednesday at 10 a.m. Received a lot of media. Um, the, you know, and uh, we had lengthy conversations among superintendents on Friday, and um, Lane can probably speak to it because I had to leave the meeting, but in general, what we see are that schools are working to support student voice so that if students make a decision that they want to go, it's better if they go in a coordinated and organized way uh, with participation and support by the administration. But the fact of the matter is, is that school districts may have policies against kids getting up and walking out, irrespective of the purpose or the validity of the cause. Um, so that each school is going to contend with. But we also see schools engaged in an array of other activities to support student voice around that issue in different forms. So the way I look at it is differentiated learning. Um, I think it's instructive that we would, and useful that we would have students participate in democracy. And there's a range of activities that they can participate in, from activities that are fully supported and sanctioned by the school, to those students who say, well, we're going to go and we might violate a policy, in which case there'll be a consequence. But like any act of civil disobedience, there's often a consequence. So it's a learning experience across the board. Um, and as you point out, there will be a series of these because um, what we're seeing nationally is a lot of activity and interest around what folks recognize as a, and young people in particular, recognize as a compelling issue that they want to be heard on. And they think as educators, we support that. So it, it makes sense. I mean, you know, some of our standards for the kids themselves are to be civic minded. Um, but there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. And like Brooke and I were talking, I think, a little bit earlier about it. It's like, you know, if the students are going to be out for the, those 17 minutes, they're going to do it in a way that's not disruptive um, to the, the you know, maintenance of the, the regular school, to what's going on during the school day. And if they follow the same procedure that's in place for any other time, they're have their parents call, call it out, have them, you know, send in a note. Um, that shows some responsibility on their part. And I, I think it's a good... It's a good thing um, because kids learn the best when there are real consequences for the decisions that they make. Okay. Make this decision, yeah. If, if my my parent didn't call me out there, you know, I might be facing some uh, a, a little bit in terms of, of discipline afterwards. But by the same token, the students got to judge in in their own mind, um, you know, what their level of belief in that value is versus um, the potential consequences and that stuff that we all face every day. So I think it's, I think it's a good thing. Have you seen a uh, general interest in, in engagement here in Randolph? The um, and the the principal at the high school here would be a better spokesperson for it, but the students have come forward um, as a group, as a body, to actually try to work it out with administration to make sure that it's. Um, does the job that they are attempting to accomplish while being minimally disruptive to the school. So they have done an absolutely fantastic job of stepping up to the plate, having the right conversations with the right people to do it in, in the best way possible. So, yeah. so there, there's been quite a bit. Their focus is more on um, the school safety side of things. It's not so much a statement about guns. Um, it is a little bit, but it's really more about, about safety and feeling safe in schools. So. You know, I, I had heard that there was a small group of students that are planning on going to Washington for the march. Um, so I was a dozen maybe is what I heard, something like that. So they are committed to being heard. I think it would be a good experience um, for them. That's great. Um, especially in, in 
in a town where the ability to, to, to get out and see other parts of the world sometimes is limited depending upon, upon the students. I think mean, it's a great experience. Any questions about the funding bill or any of the other major? And one, one that was a little off. Um, we've been having some discussions uh, amongst the cabinet uh, about trying to implement a full day preschool. Um, and there was some discussion, I remember reading through one of the briefs a while back about upping the reimbursement beyond the 10 hours. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know if there had been any progress on that, if that had changed, if anybody is aware. So the, so the current method for administering pre-K provides the school district, which is the resident school district for a three or four year old, irrespective of whether the child goes to a public or private setting, the, um, the, the resident school district counts the child in their ADM count, yep. um, and then pays tuition in the case of a private provider in the amount, I think it's around $3,200 to the private provider. And if the school district operates the, 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 um, the program, then it utilizes the ADM and thus the equalized pupil count in its regular education funding method. The proposal that emerged from the Senate Education Committee would have the entire program administered by the Agency of Education. So the involvement of the school district is retracted somewhat, and the school district would receive a tuition amount um, for students that were in their program just like the private provider. It's a, it's a controversial proposal because when you consider the utilization of ADM and, and when it's equalized, it really is reflective of the education funding system pre-K to 12. Schools do a lot in terms of the overall complement of the facility and, ter and the educational environment on a pre-K to 12 basis. So we're not sure, but we've had conversations among the business managers, the school boards association, the superintendents association, and the special ed administrators. We're not sure that we agree with tuition to public schools and to independent schools or, or, or private providers. To answer your question directly, the legislation as it's currently constituted would have a tuition paid for the first 10 hours, public or private, and then if a school district offered 10 hour, up to 10 hours in addition to create a full day opportunity, then you would then you would get um, a ADM count 0.1 for every hour offered. So if it was a 20 hour um, program, you'd get a tuition amount plus an ADM. The ADM, of course, gets equalized back down to the equivalent of 0.46 because that's the multiplier for pre-K kids. Yep. Um, without getting into a lot of detail, our thinking is evolving to the point that the bill that's been suggested by the Senate Education Committee may respond to a set of problems that don't <coughs> exist. So we think that it, it may be that in an effort to improve the implementation of Act 166, the um, General Assembly, or the Senate Education Committee has sort of um, missed the opportunity to improve the law. Um, that is uh, a piece of public policy that's heavily lobbied, particularly by private providers. Um, it's a bill that was not allowed to mature in terms of its implementation before people wanted to evaluate it and make corrections to it. Um, our associations had several concerns early in the implementation of Act 166. The first was <coughs> that a 10-hour voucher for children from the most challenging socioeconomic circumstances might not be able to get complementary supports in a private setting to augment the 10 hours. So if, if you imagine a household that has a child who's three or four years old and they're, it's a, it's a, they're challenged on socioeconomic or some other circumstances, they may not be able to utilize 10 hours because they don't have the supports in place 
to go beyond that. So that was something we were interested in. Um, we also were concerned that um, if you take children um, who have special needs who are in a pre-K age group and you utilize a voucher to transport them away from their resident school district, then the continuity in terms of the supports that would come from the school system could be impeded. So the, the way the education system works is if you can have a child um, accessing the full resources from the school, then in most instances he or she is going to benefit from that in terms of their entire education experience. Because the pre-K bill is a voucher model, it may be that a child will go away to a private provider, let's say from Randolph to Montpelier, and the ability for the school to gain the continuity in supporting that family is impeded. We were concerned about that. Um, we were also concerned that while the bill um, technically allows for the establishment of a region between the school district and private providers for purposes of creating, for lack of a better term, an ecosystem between the school district and the private providers, in a tuition model, that's challenged too because you don't have a, a critical mass sometimes of kids. Um, and an ancillary point um, to, to, to that one is it also makes it difficult for the school system that might be operating a public program to know how many kids they're going to have from year to year. So when you think about how capacity works in a public education system, if you can't predict how many kids you're going to have in any given year, and this is an issue in Vermont because of declines in enrollment, that's problematic. We raise those points, our associations, six months in, and the legislature, they said, let's wait to see how this plays out a little longer. And then some of you may be familiar, there was a huge debacle around criminal record checks and trying to get that done. I don't know whether you were aware of it or familiar with it. It was at that point the legislature said, maybe we need to take a harder look at this. The place they focused was on whether joint administration by AHS, because they have a child development division, and AOE, because this is now public education, uh, were, were, was melding in the most healthy way, is what I, I would describe it. So now we're at a place where the problems associated with the implementation are becoming more well known. Some of them are looming larger than they should. Others are diminished in terms of what the actual effects are. Enter the General Assembly who said, let's work this out. Um, I think we have a long way to go before we get the state implementation of this law predict, uh, perfected. My, what I would suggest to you as a school system is that if you've got the capacity to have a strong pre-K program and to do it on a full day basis, then serious consideration should be given to doing that because I think either under the current model and administration or if the law changes along the lines that I discussed, tuition and then an ADM, yep then I would be thinking about trying to have the highest quality pre-K associated with your school because I think in many communities, Randolph included, that that would be attractive to families who had kids in the pre-K age cohort who wanted to make sure that they were getting very good education for their kids and having them do it in the continuity that is the public education system. Yeah. Because a lot of the uh, a lot of the students, you know, with the emotional disabilities, especially at that age, to have them go out um, to another provider, right, and then come back destroys kind of that therapeutic environment. It's kind of a restarting, and that kind of makes a lot of sure. sense. Sure. And yeah. the way the early childhood system evolved in Vermont, it was logical that private providers would be included because the capacities were uneven. And also, um, I think it could be um, accurately stated that the early childhood uh, system in the state has not had the same access to resources that the K-12 system has had. So part of the issue was, okay, how do we make these providers who play an extraordinarily important role more viable? And one way to do it was to give them access when they were providing education to education fund dollars. A challenge associated with this law is that it's pretty theoretical, and as you all know, 
theory and practice are two different things, and they're especially two different things when you try to take um, a law like this and implement it over, until Act 46 really took hold, we had more than 270 school districts in Vermont. So I think, you know, we, we didn't come to talk about Act 46, but Act 46 from a system standpoint is causing the organization of public education in the state to be much more um, adaptable and receptive to what we're trying to do educationally, but you know that you couldn't wait, nor would you have waited to implement other policies. So we're still sorting a lot. I mean, there's a lot that's being worked out. Um, so in terms of the potential changes to the the preschool laws, um, not on the horizon anytime soon. Well, if they move ahead with eliminating ADM. Yep. You know, not every public school district can move to offer 20 hours a week of pre-K. And the loss, the corresponding loss of ADM could be pretty devastating for local budgets and tax rates. So our organization's position is if that stays in there, it's better to have no bill pass this session than to have one that would eliminate ADM uh, for pre-K. It remains to be seen what the House Education Committee will do. They've taken some testimony on it, but have not um, developed their own draft. I know that they have concerns about the loss of ADM. And it's, I mean, it's kind of, it's, it is, I've been engaged in the education policy area for quite some time. This is as complicated an issue because of the multifaceted, multidimensional nature of it. Um, so, I, but I, you know, that stated, if you've got a school system that's operating at scale and you're in a community that, or communities that would benefit from having high quality pre-K, I think uh, I would encourage you to do what you can to make sure it's available. It's, one of the ironies of the implementation of Act 166 was that our organizations were probably among the stronger, if not the strongest, advocates for um, the passage of 166. You know, you can't find, I don't believe you can find an educator who doesn't think that early education is one of the top strategies educationally. So we had a lot of optimism about what this law would be, and it hasn't quite played out the way that we hoped it would, and we're, gonna, we're trying to get a course correction. Nicole, can you explain about your comment on ADM because um, just so that we understand a little bit more about that, we have new board members. Sure. So, as an old board member, I'm kind of familiar with what you're talking about. But. Sure, sure. I'll do my best. So as Jeff said, the, the current framework for pre-K is that the school district administers the program. So whether they're um, operating an actual pre-K classroom in their school buildings um, or paying tuition to private providers, the school district is responsible for ensuring access for all resident three and four-year-olds. In exchange for that, the, um, school districts can count those resident children as part of their average daily membership. Um, because it's only 10 hours a week, it's not a full kid, it's just less than half of a kid. <laughs> um, but, um, those numbers, that infusion of new student count, um, has been, um, I think, really critical over the last couple of years for some school districts that were facing declines in enrollment and um, increasing tax rates. So our tax rates are a function of spending per equalized student. Your equalized student count builds off of your average daily membership. So new students coming in through the pre-K program and being counted as part of the school district's student count um, has, has allowed districts to um, uh, develop systems around pre-kindergarten. If those students, the proposal now is to say the agency of education is going to administer the program. So it's taking it away from the school boards and school districts. And um, thereby eliminate, eliminating the ability of a school district to count those resident children. The only way they could count those 
um, resident children would be if they offer more than 10 hours a week and every hour in addition to the 10 is prorated against the 0.46. So it arguably um, could have a direct impact on property taxes, <coughs> but just as importantly, um, it removes the school district entirely from the relationship it now has with both public and private programs in terms of, um, you know, there are pre-K coordinators that have been hired by school districts that really are, are, are overseeing the development of a system. This basically blows out the notion of any kind of a system and converts it to a pure voucher model. Um, is this all just because of the background checks? Of, is, is the state going to do it or the local school board or the superintendent going to do it? Is, it, is, is it, that why? It came about, the conversations <clears throat> between the Agency of Education and the Agency of Human Services came about because of the record check problem. Um, and, but again, as Jeff said, you know, we identified, our associations identified a set of problems that were over here, some of which touched upon dual regulation and oversight not working well when you've got two agencies trying to jointly administer a program as complex as this one is. You know, opportunities for inefficiencies and mistakes and chaos abound, which is what we saw. Um, but we identified a pretty discrete set of issues, none of which are addressed by these, by this proposal. And in fact, I think it, this proposal creates some new issues. That helpful? Very much. Okay. What about the new funding? Um, what what what, are, what are they looking at? Where where does it look like it's headed? If 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 change, does it look like there will be change this time or next year? Well, if it gets out of the house, it's going to be headed for Senator McDonald. So I'm glad he just came in um, <laughs> because that's where your advocacy will rest. Um, the. Uh, do you want to give an overview of what it does? Would you be willing to do that? I just you have it there, and I just closed it out. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So it just passed uh, Ways and Means and it's in Education. Hell, it's, it's yeah. really small. <laughs> so <laughs> like, like, in the, like reading, I'll get. <laughs> in the in the report that we sent on Friday, there's a link to a summary that is just a few pages long, a couple pages I think. So that might be a useful resource. Um, so, a week and a half before town meeting day, the Ways and Means Committee said we're not going to make changes to the funding formula for FY19. Literally four days later, they were voting on this totally new proposal. So I can't predict what's going to happen. Um, uh, the, the original proposal that they wrestled with for eight weeks, six weeks, would have done, made some pretty fundamental changes to the funding formula, including the elimination of income sensitivity, moving to um, create a new uh, income tax, um, and um, a variety of other changes. This new version retains, first of all, applies to FY19, um, moves to a base spending amount, um, that gets phased in over three years, but for FY19, it would be just under $12,000 for equalized pupil. Any amount that a district spends above that would be divided by a property dollar equivalent yield of $8,500. So one of the goals originally was to simplify the funding formula. It, this does not accomplish that, that goal. It, um, it, int it sort of melds two concepts. One is an old concept of base spending with this new concept that's only been in place for a year or two, which is the yield. It's intended to make it more expensive for districts to spend more than the base spending amount. So it basically shifts the curve, the slope of the curve um, on the tax um, consequences of education spending on the higher end. 
So the question that, that I have with a proposal like that mm -hmm. is doesn't that get the state back into the equity issues that it had when it went to an ed fund to begin with? Because more wealthier districts are going to be able to spend more of that extra than poorer districts. So it still it attorneys for the legislature have said that they do not believe it runs afoul of our constitutional obligations to ensure equal access to educational resources because it's still based so on minimum. you spend the same amount of money, you have the same tax rate. So that truth doesn't go away. It's how that tax rate gets calculated is different. But it still keys off of if you spend the same amount per student, no matter what town you're in, your tax rate's the same. And that's the what to date has passed the Brigham test. Brigham is the it's just a financial <laughs> analysis as opposed to a qualitative determination. Right. Right. It seems like a very low base spending amount though. Seeing that right now it's about fourteen something. Uh, state state averages this I think was predicted this year like fifteen million. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not intended to say this is what you should be spending or this is what the average should be. It's literally as it is every year or in every sort of iteration of this formula, it's a math problem. And these are different figures that are used to to get to a, a, a result. But it's not it should not be taken as um, school districts ought to be spending twelve thousand dollars per student. So it's not like this is this is what we've determined would provide an adequate education. Right. No. Mm -hmm. It's 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 this is <laughs> the number that works for the math problem that we have to work our way through in order to get to a tax rate. So that you know, one of the interesting aspects of this are uh, what happens in the public policy process when you start down a road and decide you have to keep going. Um, because that's, but that, I mean, that's basically what's, what's transpiring here. There's been a lot of interest in the recent years about sh shifting more on the income. We were, they were predicting the administration and the General Assembly in, in general were predicting extraordinarily steep property tax increases, largely because they were predicting 3.5% growth in uh, ed spending, and they used a lot of one-time money um, at the end of the last session in order to lower property tax rates. So, I, I you know, I, I wouldn't assert that it was a manufactured crisis, but there was an expectation that they were heading into this budget cycle with heavy pressure on budgets. Um, the tax commissioner suggested that budgets would go up three and a half, ed spending would go up three and a half percent. Governor Scott said, we really want you to give it the good old college try and see if you can't, can't keep ed spending per pupil, equalized pupil, at 2.5. As a result of the work that you and other school boards did around the state, um, ed spending is going up 1.5%, and ed spending per equalized pupil is up less than 1%. So the position that our associations have taken is that you've met your obligation. So because you've met your obligation, we're really asking for two things. One is, if you want to adjust public policy around education funding and have a full set of deliberations around how to do that in Vermont, fantastic. But don't change the rules of the game for the places that have passed their budget. So you looked at your budgets in one context, you ought to be allowed to continue that context. I'll come back to that, that point. And then secondly, we have a history in the state in recent years of um, cost containment features that get implemented one year and then repeal the next. So what we said was, let's not, let's not um, get carried away with cost containment. We think that local school officials are doing a pretty good job, particularly in the context of opportunities now that there's a lot more unified school districts. So let's let that course Play out. run its course. The challenge is there's still property tax pressures now largely attributable to use of that one-time money. So I think that the General Assembly has an interest in mitigating that influence. And one way to do it is to make adjustments to the funding formula 
So the proposal that Nicole was talking about has an income feature intended to generate about $60 million, $60 million through a surcharge. So the conversation that's happening in the General Assembly right now is, can you use the change in the education funding formula to lower tax rates in FY19? The answer is yes. But for taxpayers, many would have to calculate what their property tax bill will be and also what their income surcharge that they haven't had for education before will be. So I think it could be persuasively argued that we're taking a fairly complicated application of the head funding formula, which is what we have currently. In principle, it's relatively simple. When you try to understand for all its elements, it gets more complex. I would say that you're making it more complex through the, this is my opinion, through these changes, when really a better approach might be school districts did pretty well this year. Let's let them continue to do well. If you want to slow down the conversations about changes to the education funding formula, sure, but let's not, you know, hastily try to affect public policy around that funding because I believe that if you do it this year, you won't do it again for perhaps another five years. We're not going to get engaged in. And if you're trending it toward cost containment because the unified districts are responding because they now have opportunities for better management of dollars while they expand student opportunities, let's run that course as opposed to the course that they seem to be on. Again, my opinion. And I would also say school districts upheld their own end of the bargain. So if you want to like focus on cost containment, why not take a look at cost containment over a, let's be more planful, let's work together. Maybe we'll get some strategies that will take one or two or three years to arrive at rather than come back. So in, a, in what was a what have you done for me lately move, the governor's administration, I didn't hear the governor himself say this, but his administration said, yeah, it's great that school districts came in less than 1% net spending per pupil, and it's great that they came in 1.5% net spending overall, but we're still looking for another 40 million. 40 million can only get accomplished or be accomplished if you reduce personnel. And I think that a lot of contracts are, have been settled with, with uh, uh, letters of agreement being issued right, right around now. So um, The other... Um or you could change the funding formula and create a new revenue source and raise $60 million. That's the right. way to do it. I would <laughs> also add to this the fact that I think the politics behind it are what's been driving it, right? You had ways and means. We don't know anything about politics. Right? <laughs> been taking testimony on this other formula for eight weeks, two months, thought they were on the right track. Then they said, oh, there's major holes in this. They were going around the state saying, oh, we're cutting your property taxes in half. And then they said, wait, these have a lot of unintended consequences that are going to be really challenging for a lot of districts. So they backed off that. School boards did their job and said, you know, we're going to really take a hard look at our budgets this year. But now they're trying to say, oh, let's, we've got to, we started this conversation, we've got to produce something. But my opinion, I'm not deeply in education. I'm doing healthcare, which is also pretty complicated. Good policy is not made in four days. Good policy is not made in two weeks. So. I think that the School Board Association is on the right track about saying, listen, if we're pursuing, whether it's cost containment, whether it's a, you know, a broader um, view at how we fund education in the state, it's got to be a lengthy discussion. A couple of other little surprises that, that emerged in that bill that, again, had not been discussed, no testimony taken. Um, was uh, eliminates the 5% provisions in Acts 153, 156, and 46. So those of you that have voted to merge, and one of the incentives to merge was that your tax rate won't go up or down more than 5% during the years in which you're receiving incentives. Repeals those provisions. Um, also would require school districts to take on the cost of teachers' retirement in their local budgets. So again, came out of, it's not that it came out of nowhere because that has, that concept has been discussed. The language emerged 
um, out of nowhere. And it's not clear to me how it interacts with the $1,000 penalty per new hire. School districts are already paying towards the teacher's retirement system, um, or assessment rather than penalty, or the how the treasurer's office would calculate how much of the annual payment for teacher's retirement would get assigned or allocated to a specific district. But um, last year they moved the um, annual cost of the retirement system into the education fund for the first time, but it was coming off the top of the ed fund, meaning it was a shared obligation for all, um, all districts. This shift um, could have significant uh, impacts on, on local um, budgets. And as I the, um, had a conversation with um, folks from the NEA, said it really could pit active employees versus retirees in terms of um, percentage of the but you know. Mm -hmm. So it's um, that is uh, troubling that that type of a proposal um, made it out of committee with no testimony from those impacted. So we'll, we'll be work, working on that um, as well. You alluded at the beginning to a new form of uh, funding of special ed. A block grant, was that? And what does that mean for us? So um, we, success, so we successfully um, worked with the House Education Committee to delay implementation of, of moving to a census, a block grant model um, until 20, fiscal year 21 and created an implementation work group comprised of folks from on the ground in the field and from our association to look into what the um, appropriate um, funding amounts should be and how they should be uh, calculated in terms of um, weighting of students. So there was, um, there have been several studies done on the way we deliver and fund educate, special education in Vermont. And we clearly have room for improvement. And the um, special ed administrators and superintendents and principals um, believe that moving to a more flexible funding model will allow them to actually invest in the types of early interventions, um, instructional um, supports that are critical to um, supporting all struggling learners, and so and which will then lead to fewer special education students um, being identified. So we were very clear that just changing the funding model is not sufficient. You need supports for changing practice within schools. And so, um, so the way the bill is constructed, it really is intended to focus on both pieces. And, and um, I think it adds three positions to the agency of education, has appropriations for technical assistance to school districts, um, and tasks this work group with advising the agency of education on what the funding model should be. So that was a big improvement from the first draft of the bill, which just put the funding model from one study, sort of picked one assumption and put it in the statute without taking the kind of time that we think really needs to happen to, number one, build a lot of buy-in around the state, understanding of what does this mean. Um, so we are um, optimistic. Unfortunately, the bill is also being, um, was an early on built uh, in some cases by the leadership as a cost containment bill. And so um, now it's in the House Appropriations Committee, and they want to know where the where the savings is. Um, and there and there's a, a lot of investments in the bill to staff the agency and do some of the technical assistance. So I'm concerned that we may um, see some things get added to the bill that are designed to. Um, claw back some money earlier rather than wait until 21. What I would add um, and is that the basis for the legislation that we're discussing was, in, was these two studies. So UVM did a study on the education funding formula in Vermont that um, seemed to conclude that census-based model would be preferable. 
and the district management group did 10 pilots in terms of um, educational practices and support struggling students, including in this district, supervisory yep. unit. So, uh, um, so you can, both of those are online. So if you had a real interest in how this was all unfolding, you can look at both of those reports. As Nicole pointed out, the intent is to align utilization and resources with best practice in order to get higher value for dollar in terms of supporting all students. And I, it's, um, our organizations are, I think, We've been persuaded that it is a change that would be helpful, as Nicole indicated, it's FY21, and, and we want a strong involvement of education practitioners from teachers and special educators right through school boards so that we can get a full implementation of the law because it's, it's it's, it constitutes a change in practice. People have, will have to think differently about the educational process and so our, we're suggesting that we do it, but we take our time to make sure that we get really solid implementation. To go back to something I said earlier, we're gonna, I believe that under the Act 46 construct and unified districts, we're going to be better able to implement a law like this than we otherwise would have, been, would have done. But um, it's inherently problematic to be moving to change the way we fund special education in a pretty dramatic way. At the same time, we're talking about an overhaul of the funding formula generally, which is being done in a pretty rushed manner. And, and uh, looking to change ADM through a pre-K bill. All three things impact how education is funded and nobody's talking to one another that I can tell in a way that's like, okay, I, let's identify some unintended consequences. Let's think through how all of these different um, interventions will intersect. So how can we best support your work and engage? Uh, obviously, we have wonderful local legislators. Um, who take the time to understand the impacts of our system, but this idea of you know the rug being pulled out from under us after the promises made for Act 46, all of the time, effort, and resources that were devoted to that effort, and we had many people in our community say, come on, you know, they're saying that they're gonna do you know, they're going to give you a tax break, but you just wait and see. That's not going to end up happening. And now it seems like they were right. Our, you know, if our protections that were the quid pro quo of going through that unification process um, is now um, at risk, what can we do? Is I mean, who is driving the bus here? Not sure where that is coming from. The five percent, um, as I said, came out of nowhere. No testimony. I really don't know who's driving that. Um, uh, so it is now in the House Education Committee. Um, they're expected to vote on it in the next day or so. Um, and so contacting members of that committee at this point is useful. We're going to send um, an alert out before it goes to the floor so that you all can contact all members. But at this point in time, contacting the members of the House Education Committee is the best way to try and get it changed before it goes to the floor. And you know, We have all that information on our, on our website. Yeah, yeah. You know, getting a real handle on this, though, is a bit elusive because if you look at it straight up in terms of tax rates, the FY19 implementation drops tax rates on average by 15 cents. So when we testify tomorrow, they're likely to say to us, how can you testify against the 15 cent tax reduction? The, and the response to that is, it's still hurried. It's still you know, we don't know what the ultimate consequences will be, and 
there's a sixty million dollars in income taxes that hadn't been collected as an income tax before, so that the you would need as a taxpayer to understand what's happening to your property tax liability, what's happening to your income tax liability. And the packaging of this law is um, H-911, which is intended to respond to the tax cuts at the federal level at the same time we adjust the education taxes. So, I mean, I think it would be harsh of me to talk about the prospects for obfuscation, but it's not readily apparent to somebody who can look at sort of the cause and effect. And people would say, well, folks are challenged to be, to, to understand the cause and effect under the current system. That may or may not be true, but that doesn't justify another confusing law, if you think that this one's confusing. The other thing that this does that we didn't mention is it would split the billing for municipal taxes and education taxes. So now in communities it's a combined bill taxpayers would now get two bills they'd get a municipal bill and an education bill um, so there's a lot to it and you know we're gonna we'll weigh in tomorrow I I, I, I it's difficult to predict where exactly it's going to end up and the Senate will take a fresh look at it if it gets to the Senate about five minutes uh, left for this portion if there's uh, probably one more question time I, I would just also add to that that Jay and I both have been working uh, with some of our colleagues on house education throughout this whole process we raised some concerns about what the original bill was at least communicating with some of them about what this could mean for at least some of our district um, and some of the things that we're worrying but I would add <laughs> this things they slapped this together with some pieces of the old some of these new some things that came out of the blue kind of so tracking this is making it extremely hard. Bills generally don't go through in two days through an education committee, uh, especially one with such um, large, large reaching ramifications as this. So. Mr. Maybe McDonald. we should give Senator McDonald the last word on all of this. Mm -hmm. For uh, 20 years since Act 60 passed, for 18 years, um, the old towns have been upset with it that um, they were being you know, taxed to pay for everyone else. And I was last year for the first time, um, the, the statement was no longer that the gold towns were supporting <laughs> the poor towns, it was the poor towns are being forced to support the gold towns, the high spenders. And I was absolutely flabbergasted. And, uh, and I can only think that after 18 years of saying the same thing, that, that the gall towns were uh, getting a bad deal, and that wasn't resonating with anybody, that they sort of changed the story. And as soon as you tell the legislature that all the poor towns are supporting the, the wealthy towns, they begin to quiver, that, you know, what are we going to do? Um, I've been speaking with Janet Ansel since the, uh, the chair of Ways and Means since the beginning and I said what, what you're telling me is that the property tax rates are going to go down and the people whose property is the most valuable are going to get most of the money and that's the gold places. Now you could argue that the gold towns have higher incomes so they might be contributing more on the income tax end but it disconnects the connection between your spending and your tax rate from the, the original bill that the House proposed makes there's less of a connection. Um, more, you're, there's no more. The 70 percent of people who pay uh, based on their income on their house and two acres don't get to do that anymore. Um, the whole thing scared me, and I wasn't surprised on what on Wednesday or Thursday when Janet said, "Well, uh, we actually ran the numbers, and they don't look quite as good as they uh, as we thought they would." So now there's a bit of a panic. Um, the other reason, last year the legislature got burned, perhaps the governor feels that he got burned, but we got to the end of the year and to, when, you veto, when you veto the appropriations bill because of what local taxpayers voted, um, that's a tough connection to make. And uh, we've been saying to ourselves, 
the governor suggested if property tax rates don't go down, that he's going to veto something in the legislature. Well, towns decide what they're going to spend, mm -hmm. and you know, one, you know, just over one percent. You know, this is as you know, you've been as frugal as 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 you were between two thousand. Nine and 2012, when they were three years in a row, where it was about 1.1%. So I, I've been away for a couple of days, and I, Jeff was catching me up on the, on the numbers. I, you know, I apologize. I came home and I did all my chores and cleaned out the driveway and the mailbox, and I said, oh, I have time to take a nap, and I hadn't set my clock. <laughs> <laughs> so I apologize. Good. I think Jan and Ansel have gotten in the bus. Yeah. We assume maybe Dave Shot. So I wanna, wanna thank our guests. Thank you. Thank Mark, you Ben, Jay, Nicole, and Jeff. Oh, for the pleasure. Safe journeys. And thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks for coming. Thank, thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thanks really for your work. Thank you. Don't forget there's coffee and food. Have fun reorganizing. <laughs> <laughs> Jay also sent me a text to say to her. Yeah, I gave it back to him. You bet. Printed mine out. Ready. Taking. Some sports Is Rachel too? Thank you. And good luck. Looks like you're gonna have a lot to do. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. And then uh, the board does welcome input uh, from the community. Uh, I don't know if anyone would like to speak. So open up the floor now for the board to discuss uh, anything that they feel is pertinent and important that came out of town meeting. At the three different towns. Yeah, if Chris Recchio were here, were here, he could explain the difference between magnesium and manganese, but <laughs> um, I'll talk about Randolph. We, um, we had I guess I'll suffice it to say that um, there were some concerns about uh, select board um, in Randolph and executive sessions and how the board was operating and how their employee um, was being met with. And it really goes to the heart of governance. And um, so I, I spoke. Uh, later in the meeting and um, just to really give a voice to the idea that um, we as public officials hold a public trust and it is essential that our work is transparent so that the citizens of our town understand and know how we're making our decisions, what we're basing them on, um, so that citizens feel that they have input and they can observe and participate in our government. Um, I also talked about, because there was an accusation made about something or other happened in executive session, it was made by a private citizen, and so I, I raised the question, how would a private citizen know what is occurring in executive session? That is a confidential meeting. Um, that are, we meet in an executive session for very narrow reasons. And it's important in certain instances, such as dealing with an employee issue. In our setting, we deal with student issues and other um, issues like mediation, litigation, where premature public knowledge would put the board at a substantial disadvantage. Um, but I really tried to drive home the point that we as public officials have to safeguard 
um, that public trust. And there are two parts of it, transparency, but then also making sure that we protect the confidential information that, for very narrow reasons, requires confidentiality. Um, and so I just would reiterate that to this board. I think that with our governance model, we um, are very acutely aware of our responsibilities um, of confidentiality and transparency, and I think that we do good work in that regard. So I would say that um, while we're endeavoring to, to enhance public participation, um, we need to also be sure that we re regularly remind ourselves that we are, um, this isn't, you know, us individually making decisions. It's us as a board. We are a body, and it is the board that makes decisions, not one individual person. Um, so I would say, from my years on the board, we do an excellent job at that, but we have to be vigilant in terms of making sure that we're communicating and people understand how the board operates. <laughs> At uh, Braintree, did Ange get recognized? He did. He wasn't there, but he was right. <laughs> he heard about it. I talked about it. <laughs> the only thing I mentioned from Brookfield is there was a little bit of confusion, and I don't know where it stemmed from um, around there being discussion um, after the regular town meeting. As many of you guys, you know, until we did sort of transition, the school board, you know, would have its own meeting after the, the town meeting was done. Um, and so there was a little bit of confusion about whether or not that was going to happen. Just because it was of a new, funny new thing. consolidation. Well, there was an no, article. There was, a, there was a, a line in, I don't know whether it's your report or sort of a, a board report that said something like, you know, the discussion would follow at the meeting. There was in the administrators, the elementary administrators, because I okay. thought I striked it. Yeah, okay. no, it was in there, and so the moderator it. brought them up, up and yeah. said, it says that there's discussion following. Yeah. yeah. And no, because a lot of the discussion too with me being new was it sounded like everything was now consolidated in that one meeting that we had. Should have been. On Monday. Should yeah, have been. Yeah, right. Yeah, so that was a mistake in the town, in the in the book that went out, and I'm not sure to what that was attributed to. The only other thing book? I think we, sh we needed to be clearer about uh, annual report yeah. was um, people came up and asked whether they should be voting for just Brookfield um, mm -hmm. school board reps and, and not voting for the others. And um, it was too late because I was at the they had just voted, but they said, oh, I, I just left the rest blank because I thought, you know, so I think we need to better um, advertise or publicize what what the role of you know how, how the school board people are elected, um, chosen, and sort of you know the makeup of the board. Right. You know we all vote. You know that was a very conscious decision. I we did have that. that conversation as well with with a couple people, but I don't think that it really. I don't know whether they voted prior to or after. I just don't know but it was more of a clarification. Mm -hmm. I think maybe at the top of the ballot should have been a very clear, you know, every resident votes for every district, um, but we really should ha also have that probably in some some um, materials pre prior to the, the, say, the town meeting, yeah. To the vote. Maybe there's an opportunity to do some, you know, outreach or share some information either through Front Porch Forum or, I mean, another, you know, New school newsletters or other avenues um, to just make sure that voters understand the process. The makeup of the board. Too. It, yep. And then also the informational meeting. I mean, I think part of the conversations that I was engaged in after that question came up at town meeting, it, there were some people who didn't necessarily understand that that Monday night informational meeting was for the full budget for OSSD. And, and so I think it, we're in a year transition, a little bit of confusion is just completely yep. ex to be expected. Uh, but maybe just some, if we were to capture any lessons learned, there's just an opportunity, I think, to maybe share more information uh, before town meeting day. I, I think the, the, the reflection of that is incredibly valuable to make sure that, you know, we can obviously with the district itself, us, us, myself, and the other administrators can make sure that that work gets out. Yeah. Um, so. That's great. Yeah, and I, of course, I was a clerk, so I tallied them, and there were a lot of blanks, and I'm like, oh, 
Yeah, we really need to work on that. Mm -hmm. I put that down too in, in, in my notes. Um, I keep kind of a monthly calendar, and so when we get close to this time next time around. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Who do we talk to to change the wording on the ballot to just clarify that? Me. Can I make the ballot. Yeah, you make so, the ballot any, you, you know, have. I've only taken what we had from previous right. years, and so I'm up well, for any easy. suggestion as long as. I may have to run it by like Joyce of to make course. sure it's legal mm -hmm. or whatever. Well, so I think just the statement yeah. that all towns get to vote on. Yeah. All, mm -hmm. all, yeah. all, there should be a way yeah. that but people, the the people handing out the ballots to just to explain. I mean, usually they explain to me you have to do the front and back and put these out and just add something to say. Yeah. Also, you mm -hmm. vote for every every time. Yeah. Yeah. But the comment on the, the the total board makeup as well, I think, is is important to make sure that folks are educated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of Calvin Terrell, um, this was actually supported by the board and I thank them very much for this for the district. Um, Calvin uh, is a speaker that is going to come in on the 27th and 28th of March. Um, he, his focus and his job is, is to work on improving school climate um, at the student level, to get the students kind of involved um, in their own work around improving the climate um, at uh, Randolph Union High School as well as the, the Technical Center. Um, he talks a lot with the students about the foundations of hate. Um, he gives an incredibly powerful and moving presentation um, for about two to two and a half hours. Um, that focuses on uh, where the path of hate leads if, if folks aren't careful. Um, and so we built a whole two-day uh, program around this, and I have to thank the National Honor Society and the National Honor Society students um, for actually doing probably 99% of the logistical work um, around, around uh, Calvin. Um, on the 27th, um, he will be coming in, um, spending some time going through classrooms in the morning, checking in with students, checking in with faculty. Um, he is set up in the media conference room as well for a bit of time for people that just want to drop in and have a private conversation with him. And and that time is meant for him to get a real feel um, from the actual school community of, of what they feel their, their issues are, um, what needs to be addressed. And he will tailor his conversation that he has um, somewhat with them later that afternoon um, around what they've identified as their needs. Um, he will meet um, at lunchtime on the first day with a cohort of students that he will be working on the second day, which I will get into. Um, that'll be the first time that they meet and kind of do a little bit of planning and kind of a get to know you. Um, from 12.30 to 2.22, uh, he will have his presentation in the auditorium um, for the high school as well as the tech center together and, and all the faculty. Um, afterwards, he will be working uh, with the faculty um, and doing some work around climate, ways that they can interact um, with the kids um, that will help things and ways that they can interact a little better with each other. Um, after that, we will be having a dinner at 5.30 for the communities. Um, for anyone who wants to attend, um, the dinner will be free. Um, give an opportunity for the parents to come in, sit down, relax a little bit, give uh, Calvin some time to kind of circulate around and talk with the parents, talk with the community members about what their concerns are, if any, um, about the climate um, at the, the high school and at the tech center. And then that evening around 7 o'clock, um, he will put on a full presentation for the community. Um, as follow-up to make sure that the good work that is started on the 27th does not die, um, he has set up with uh, three different student groups uh, at the high school. Um, the National Honor Society Stats, which is uh, one that I hadn't heard of before, but I guess that's what their um, leadership, student leadership uh, group has, has evolved into. Um, as well as a school climate club um, will be three separate cohorts that he will spend a day training um, in terms of how to better connect with the community, how to better connect with other students, um, and how to lead uh, the climate change after he is gone. Um, and so there's a lot of good work that will come out of that. So we're very excited about that and very thankful to the board um, for supporting that funding because it came out of your discretionary fund. Uh, so questions on, on that? 
said high school, middle school and high school? Middle school and high school, I say. I think about it as the building I should be thinking about the kids. Yeah. Um, and how's um, publicity going to run for that evening event? So uh, we've actually got Ben Merrill working on a brochure that is going to go out and get posted. Um, he's very excited about that, and the kids are working with him to develop that. Um, they're getting Calvin's bio. There is also an opt-out um, form that needs to go out to the community. His presentation is, is pretty powerful, um, just to give people kind of an idea um, about, about the details of what he's going to go into um, and, and give uh, parents and uh, students who may have um, some pretty strong sensitivities the, the heads up. Um, about it, so that will go out. Um, also, we were planning on, on getting something in the paper um, as well uh, to the three communities. Um, he is also, and they, it's actually the students worked a little faster um, than than I anticipated. The uh, the climate club uh, wanted to bring in Ed Garrity, and we were actually planning on uh, Ed Garrity as being a follow up to Calvin Terrell. Uh, they were able to get it done. They they had his presentation um, last Friday. Um, which was incredible. There was a lot of good positive comments from the community already that came in um, this morning about it. Um, and he deals with you know the power of positive thinking um, and small acts of kindness and how they can change uh, school climate. So we've got a, a year or two worth of um, some pretty strong speakers, some pretty strong ideas coming in, a lot of it student-based um, to really have an impact uh, that, that's permanent uh, across the district. So thank you. Money set aside for anti-defamation league training for the students for the World of Difference program, um, and they are also talking about Rachel's challenge at this point in time, which is good. So, thank you. In terms of the kids you were talking about that would be trained um, for the future, um, is that from the National Honor Society group or what they the National Honor Society did was they reached out to the other groups. Um, other clubs and, and committees around the school and the ones that have stepped up to the plate. I got my exact list here. There were three so far. Uh, it was National Honor Society, it was the school climate. Uh, yeah, sorry about that, Y-A-T-S-T. -S um, and the other one potentially is the Interact Club um, that, that has expressed some interest at this point in time. And so those will be groups of kids. Um, what he did at Marblehead, which was kind of neat when he had, had three or four groups, is they each kind of focused on the climate in a different aspect. These folks were working um, with some faculty members on the, the climate amongst the faculty. These guys are more student-based. Uh, this cohort was more about you know connecting better with the community um, and improving the interactions of the school with the community and improving the community climate. So he really um, put on pretty good training for them and they're continuing that work to this day. That was three years ago now. So I'm just wondering if you know the so the, the National Honor Society is junior and seniors, I think. Yep. So the seniors are two months from graduating when this happens. Yep. I was just wondering when did they invite their the sophomore would it be the sophomores that would be rising to juniors at some point, don't they invite new membership? Yeah. I don't know if the timing would work, but is it? Are we capable of getting any of our? I think a lot of that's through the school students? climate, but it's I can have the discussion with it. I mean, this is not closed off. It's not meant to be that selective. This was just the easiest way to, to kind of reach out to folks. So I think it's a good point. And I thought the yes was a all grades. It is. Yeah, that was the old. They, they said that was the old uh, uh, yeah, student they, leadership. Yeah, but you know there may be some kids that don't want to. That's sort of still perceived as student government, and there may be kids who didn't have an interest in that, but they might have an interest in individual. school, you know, individually. So if there's any way to um, attract more ambassadors, more kids that would be interested in delving a little bit deeper into those, uh, whatever, whatever they, they're going to be teaching them in terms of ways to help or you know to be in the school for supporting this effort it seems like that would really behoove us it's, you know because a lot of these kids are about to right say maybe thinking away. about it in terms of representation across the ages that you know maybe there's a handful of kids at each probably can't do each grade level yeah, no i will we'll figure out a way um I'll talk again with uh, with Kelly Tucker pretty soon um, to see if we can do the reach out. The other piece, um, when we did the planning for the Anti-Defamation League work, um, was really reaching out um, more to the younger grades. 
Um, and those are our peer, peers teaching peers with the World of Difference program. The, the students go through the week-long training, and then they come back <coughs> excuse me, during the advisory periods, and they actually, it's student-to-student -student delivered training. Um, and so because that one, the activities typically go on kind of a two-year cycle that they do. On that one, we were looking more for kind of sophomores and juniors, people that were going to be around long enough, and then they can help integrate the, the newer kids that come up in, in a year or two. Um, it would be helpful. Um, so we've got some good ideas. But yeah, I, I like the idea about that. And um, it's, it's nice to have the input, too, because we get so focused sometimes on the logistics and the details that we get the bigger picture sometimes. That's good. So other questions on? All right. Um, board management and governance, uh, reorganizing board and committees. Um, the first rule of business um, is to elect a board chair. Um, so the process will be um, nominations. Uh, and then once we get to the point where there's been seconds or seconds, um, is to move into discussion and then vote. Um, at that point in time, once a board chair has been um, elected, I will hand off the chairmanship duties for tonight to that person to continue the meeting. Um, so I want to open up uh, to nominations for school board chair. I'd like to nominate Laura Rochefort for chair. I'd like a second that. Other. Uh, discussion doesn't mean you have to, but it's appropriate. Is Laura in support? I've said I would do it. Okay. Well, then, that's it's support. better to have it out there. <laughs> 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 I was wondering, do we have, um, you know, I just, just thinking about this, like, I mean, obviously you've been around so you know what the role of the chair is, but do we have anywhere, like, in our documentation kind of, Position description, kind of, they're like, you know, for the, what the role of the chair is versus the vice chair. Yeah, we do. I've read it. I, I can I can see if I can pull it up. It's and it should be appropriate for kind of a sit down kind of conversation. It's yeah. one of the policies that says um, role of the board chair. It, yeah, no, I just, I, I don't feel like I've ever seen it. So maybe circulating. So we look at the executive limitations all the time. Yeah. But there's also the, um, governance. It's part of the board governance policy. Mm -hmm. You can't spit up a number, but it's there. And I didn't bring it with me tonight, but we have a board chair guidance document uh, okay. yeah. from from Carver. Yeah. And it's about that. <laughs> <laughs> Got a lot to learn. Yeah. <laughs> I have a thin book. I have a thin book. That's great. Yeah, when I was when I was cleaning out the office over vacation, um, I found the little Carver manuals. There are like nine of them. They're very thin, but they focus on different aspects. And there is it's kind of a, I guess an abbreviated version cliff of the notes. Yeah, <laughs> you're talking about. Yep, the cliff notes. Great. I just wanted to make sure that that existed. Yeah, more information than you. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> just looking out for uh, Laura. <laughs> and, and you know, I I would be happy to go to you know agenda meetings you know for a couple months. Um, just if there's any guidance or questions or whatever needed, happy to do it. Next year, just some training wheels. Make yeah, sure really. everyone feels comfortable and that yeah. they can tell me to go away. <laughs> That's great. So if no more discussion, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any nays? So, unanimous. Congratulations. You get the gavel. There you go. Oh, the gavel is <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if anybody ever saw it before. Like I said, Angelo came to the last meeting, said I've had this for a while. I've got some young people at home. I can use that. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of a two by four, when you need to knock someone right. right. <laughs> All right. So the next order of business is to elect the vice chair, Kirkland Brook. Have any nominations for the vice chair? I would nominate Paul Putney. I would second that nomination. Is there any, any other? You wanna? I said I would do it. 
<laughs> I love that. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I said I would do it because it didn't sound like anybody else wanted to. <laughs> Any other discussion necessary? We probably have a booklet for you, too. Mm. There is. <laughs> Great. Any other nominations? All right. Um, we can go through the problem. Okay, Linda, we do it at the same time. Okay. How about um, for clerk, currently Ann Howard? Are you willing to serve again? Sir. Sure. We have I'll nominations for clerk. I'll make a nomination for Ann to be the clerk. I'll second it. All right. Um, we need to approve the schedule for regular meetings, which came out as part of our packet. We generally meet on the second Monday of the month, 6.30, and we rotate new positions throughout our district. Um, we need to assign a member to sign official documents. In my absence, currently, Brooke and Paul, are you two still willing to do that? Yes. OK. Um, Appoint a, a representative to RTCC. Currently, I am that. I thought you were also. I, yeah, I am the alternate, it says, but yeah, I, I, I thought, thought were. we were both doing it. Um, Me too. I'm not sure that. Is there only one from our board all of a sudden? I'm not sure. We've typically had more than one. Yeah, we've typically had two. To or three. Th I thought we had three before. We had one from. Is Angela? Yeah, it yeah. was two from the OSSD, and then there was one from the high school. And then when we. That was before the consolidation. Now that we consolidated, is there just one? I haven't, I haven't, no. I don't know. You could ask Angie, but I recall from the minutes last year that you were like a backup. Yeah. We right. only needed one, he had one. said, uh, when, he checked, when he got done. So I, I think it would be better to have two of us on that board. Yeah, I mean, it's up to you guys. I, you I have the right appreciate it. I didn't go last one because they said there was backup and they thought, oh, I'm There was no only one another. other person besides myself. Yes. Yeah. Normally it's just the two of us and then one or two people. Right. <laughs> anyway. So, you know, if you'd be. Does yeah. anyone else want to serve on the RTCC board? Tech Center. Tech Center board? They only meet once Four times once a quarter. Once a quarter. Yeah. Is there any quarter. kind of special considerations? One mm -hmm. need, need to, like, I mean, I. You're an elected official on the school board. That's, <laughs> That's the special consideration. <laughs> well, and, and RTCC is an advisory board, um, so because you know, it's technically under, well, it's under us now, and it used to be under the high school board. So, um, but, but I've been to a number of meetings over the years and have found them really interesting. Mm -hmm. They, I think they do more, well, you guys know better than I even to a lot more of it, Often there is a conversation about you know what programs that mm -hmm. will be uh, that they're looking at to bring in, or what the enrollment is, or certifications that are issuing, and making sure that you know we're very competitive and we're uh, preparing those students with really a, you know great credentials to go out into the job market. So it's it's a great board. It got to the point though where we weren't getting a lot of participation because there's like a member of it from each of the sending communities. We're still not. Just them. difficult. Yeah. yeah. Like We're the still most not. I've seen is probably three. A couple that I've been there. Yeah. yeah. It used to be better attended. It involves business um, people from the business community in Brown Randolph as well. Um, part of the problem I think has been those school board members from the sending districts have been involved in consolidations that have been very um, time consuming. Mm. So I think that's been part of the problem. Uh, if you guys want to have two people on the board, I don't know if you need to make a motion and vote to, to change that. But since you, they are under your auspice, you would, I would believe you would have the right to do that. Uh, if it was set at one, I'm not sure what it was set at prior to. So. I'm pretty sure it was three. Or, yeah. I think it was three. Maybe it was two. It was either no, two it was or three, three before. Four, it changed it just last year, I think. Yeah, because yeah. the consolidations were Remember that we did anything to the to the board structure. I didn't think we did. I didn't notice it until the last meeting. Uh, it had me list. It specifically said alternate, and that was the first time I noticed it. it. It probably said it before, but I, it was the first time I noticed it was the last. I meeting. was surprised yeah. myself. Well, but what we could do is sure, I think it's right now. one way or the other, either as the primary yeah, and an alternate. Yeah. 
and then we can go check and we can re-notice it to to amend the reorganization mm -hmm. next month. You know, if we find out that we can't open more than more one. than one, if we have to change mm -hmm. how we've structured the board. Mm -hmm. Is that right? I don't know. <laughs> but I would encourage you to come to the next meeting and see yeah. what you think. Um, and the next meeting is the most interesting one because it happens um, half, a, half an hour prior to the open house at the tech center. Mm -hmm. So we have a half hour meeting and then you can, you know, tour the tech center and all the faculty there, all the students are presenting their projects. Mm -hmm. And then it will give you a real flavor for what this center is doing. And then changing up the way we do it. All right. I don't know if we decided anything. <laughs> we haven't voted our... Yeah, um, so, so maybe we should appoint a primary and, s and then a... Uh, a back up of the back up. Yeah. And then if we want to change it... You want me to send out the minutes right from last now, time? Right now, I'm the chair. Last year? Which makes it... I mean, I don't know whether we have to re-elect... Um, if, I'm, uh, if I'm the backup and he's the primary, or, you know, I'm not sure. How do you feel about it? I guess I would say, why don't we just keep the status quo and put you in as the primary so that you can stay chair? Through the year, and then? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we'll figure out if Paul gets a full membership or if he's a stepchild. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't go to the meetings anyway. In the docu yeah, I don't documentation care. I read or in the statutes, uh, but I'll take a good look. I'll talk with Jason too. Jason's incredibly knowledgeable. I uh, don't know right off the bat. And I'll, I'll get a, an email out to the board within a day or two let you know. Yeah, personally, I would prefer to have other people who are would be willing to commit to regularly come to the meeting. Mm -hmm. So. Lastly, we have a staff contract negotiating committee. Um, so we should go ahead and actually nominate. Okay. Yes. Oh, yes. So let's nominate people to um, be RTCC representatives. Do I have any nominations from the floor? Nominate Laura for the primary. Can I nominate Paul for the secondary? I'll second Laura. I'll second. Whichever. <laughs> okay. And lastly, on our slate here, we have to we have to appoint um, a few people to um, be on the negotiating committee for a staff contract. Is that are we re are we negotiating that staff contract this year? Uh, no, it's ne year? next year. Um, okay. It'll open up for the actually. There's two that are open, but the big one is is this the CBA the teachers contract. Yes. Yeah. That's next year. Yeah, we have to. I think it's October. We have to, yeah. you know, initiate. And it says staff contracts. Previously, we had two different. Um, is this just one now? Um, staff and faculty contract negotiating committee, or is support staff? And right. Uh, but well, we traditionally, we had uh, two two different committees. Mm -hmm. You're right. um, are we saying that? The three people that are on this are going to be on both committees, or are we just talking about the staff contract, support mm -hmm. staff contract here? I think what ended up happening was we had the same people on both. Right. Um, just by happenstance. Right. This past one we did, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is technically correct. There's professional staff and there's support staff. Support so staff, I think right. the agenda is okay in terms of the warning, right. you know, that it's been noticed properly and we can take two separate votes All right. on the two different positions. Or, but in reality, I guess it's at the very end of the year that we would start preparing for the negotiations. Do, so do we want to appoint um, members then to that committee at this point? Yeah, I think we probably yeah. should. There's always the there's always the possibility of something coming up. Yeah, yeah, things so so it's kind of important to have that. So, do I have nominations for um, people who would be willing to serve on the negotiating committee? Are you separating them, teachers, and then support staff? Shall we? Why don't we? Because since we have new board members, I think it would be really helpful to, if they're, if they're willing to serve in those capacities, have a new board member maybe on, on those on committees. Each one? Or, or someone who hasn't served on that committee before, even mm -hmm. if they're not 
if they're an old board member. Okay. And that way we can have a little bit more variety to give people more experience. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. good idea. I, I prefer experience over <laughs> <laughs> You're a baby. <laughs> I'm not going to my teenager. <laughs> All right, should we start with this, the um, staff? It's your professional staff. The professional staff the negotiating committee. So how do we want to do this? I would be willing to serve um, on either or both. I think I probably have the most experience at it, so that I can try to impart that knowledge and okay. have other people have that opportunity. I'd serve on either. Okay. I'd like to continue uh, serving on the teachers, I guess okay. that's professional staff. Yep. I'd like to stop to support staff, give somebody else the opportunity. Anyone else be willing to or serve you to Rachel? Okay, sure. so we'll put Melody on one and Rachel on the other. Yeah, yeah. do you guys have a preference? And are we still lacking someone for the support staff? Mm -hmm. Well, then I'll do that. I'd be glad to. Okay, so we have Paul, Brooke, Melody on the teachers. All right, so I'll move that, that group or slate, whatever you want to call it, on the professional staff. Okay. You second it, Jen? Okay. Yep. And support staff, we have um, Ann. Yep. Rachel. And Brooke. And Brooke's going to do both? Mm hmm Okay. Motion by? I'll make that motion. Second. Second. full slate of um, committees and all to vote on. Um, oh, just one, one question about the regular meetings. Yeah. Um, 6.30 is our normal time. In the past, we've had a little bit of discussion back and forth about 6 versus 6.30. Is that anything that anybody wanted to think about before we vote on the meeting time? My understanding was that that wouldn't work for all people who need to attend, so it's just hard for me to get here okay. by 6 30, just with our schedule. So, just couldn't remember. <laughs> As was noted in the last meeting, that it says I showed up at 6 55. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> I don't appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's you miss something, it does. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I would if I could. I just, I just can't. Mm -hmm. yeah, just, can. My husband doesn't get home until six a lot of times, so. Yeah. yeah. Six thirty it is. Thank you. I appreciate that. These are early compared to Massachusetts. <laughs> All right. Shall we? Yeah. Are we prepared to vote on this slate of nominees? Yes. All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any nays? All right, I have it. Let's move on to the uh, EL monitoring. We have two reports to approve, EL 2.3, um, which Jen, you reviewed. You want to talk about that? <clears throat> so this one, I mean, in my opinion, is the easiest one to review just because there is the external audit that verifies. Um, and also, I didn't put it on here. It was just something that occurred to me today when I was thinking about this meeting. I, I think that the superintendent is in compliance and you know as we know from previous meetings he actually there was a place where it wasn't in best practice and he added an additional signer so I think you know, based on everything that was presented it's pretty black and white Melody we're talking about in, in your yeah. agenda packet that was the we we basically start at the beginning, um, and then, so we're at page okay. like three or four, or whatever. I printed it out. Can you write to have no? Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, you'll get one every meeting. Yes. With the holes punched. I know. So, it's really organized. So each of us, 
are typically asked to review um, one of Lane's uh, reports, and so we go into the office and look at all the documentation so that sometimes there are pairs of us assigned to one, but basically so then that person does due diligence to make sure that we're not missing anything. Hold Lane accountable. So this was Jen's. And it's a portion of his uh, evaluation. evaluation. You had nothing else to add then? I had a question about his interpretation and we had a conversation and I forgot to look at the whole picture as opposed to the little bullets. So Great. Secondly, it was uh, EL 2.6 and that was um, Brooke and Ann. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I didn't get it out for the packet. Um, well, here's my here. Well, now too, so. Um, do you want to make a motion? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Do 2.3? Do both at the same time. Whatever. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
subtractions that need to be made, adjustments? I didn't notice anything. No. Okay. And then, and then also we have the minutes from the budget informational meeting on February 26th. I thought that was a good mm -hmm. PowerPoint that you provided. I thought it was great. Mm -hmm. This was a more awake that time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, motion to approve the consent agenda. I make the motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So now on to the superintendent's report. Do you have something to add or? Um, uh, the, yeah, the, a couple of things have kind of popped up um, in the last couple of days, just more for information out there. Um, a good part of the last round of negotiations um, dealt with health care, um, as you guys were involved in it, probably remember. Um, part of that was discussion about the HSAs, the HRAs, um, which are the cafeteria plans that reimburse folks for um, you know, out-of-pocket expenses uh, with medical um, deductibles and things like that. The company that we and most of the state chose, uh, Future Planning, um, has decided that it no longer wants to manage our HRAs um, or anyone's in the states. They kind of bit off more than they could chew. Um, they weren't able to keep up with the demand um, and when questioned about it, they said, well, we were expecting about 5,000 submissions a month, but we were getting 18,000. Um, so at the end of this year, um, they will no longer be an option, so we will be looking um, for a replacement um, from them. Um, we had some discussions about it at the superintendent's meeting that was last Friday that uh, Jeff alluded to when he was here. Um, and the two possibilities, um, one is Datapath, um, is a company that actually manages the cards themselves that the, the folks use to swipe um, for, for to, to pay for their out-of-pocket expenses. Um, and some districts um, are investigating the possibility of you know using that company and then managing the actual paperwork piece ourselves. Brooke brought up a, a good point um, earlier today about the fact is, is, is that going to be allowable under HIPAA? So it's, that's worth worth a discussion and to take a look at. The other company that came up um, was Health Equity. Um, have them as our administrator. That was probably the second choice of most districts in and around the state and the superintendents that have it are exceptionally happy with it at this point in time. Um, so there are options av available, it's just that there's um, going to be some transition headaches um, as well as the fact that if future planning is having trouble keeping up on the number of submissions they're getting a month, you know, how timely um, are people going to be able to get the, the work done from their submissions. Um, so that's kind of going on in the background. Um, there also was a, a statement um, that came out um, with changes in the tax law um, at the federal level about um, the maximum that could occur for an HSA contribution. They've changed the limits. I'm going to check with Robin to see if that affects us. I don't believe it does. Ours <coughs> wasn't high enough to reach that, that full limit anyway, um, but just to double check. Um, and then kind of as part of the incidental, the superintendent's report, the financial um, information kind of all balled into one, is that we may be looking to talk to the board about tapping some of the facility surplus. Um, we are at the point where we had started uh, a reassessment of our safety and security protocols um, before the, the Florida shooting. Um, and we had uh, Visbit come out um, do the assessments. We have those reports. They've been reviewed. Bob and Wes have done an exceptional job um, with that. Um, we also have the survey that went out that we're collecting data from. But there are some minimal things that, that we have to do that we should do, um, and the cost is going to be about $85,000. One of the pieces is uh, making sure that there's buzzers uh, systems for the front doors of all the schools. Um, it also means that at the high school, because um, it's not quite set up for that system, that we're going to have to do some major work on the on the window 
uh, between the two doors as you come in so that there can be some interaction there as people sign in and sign out. Um, alarming all the outside doors um, during the school day uh, when students are present, um, the doors should all be locked except for one entryway um, so that all the traffic is funneled through that one entry. Um, problem is, is that students have gotten used to, especially at the high school, coming in and out any door that they can. Even though they're locked, what they'll do is, you know, they'll text a friend and say, hey, I'm coming up the back steps. Can you meet me at the door and let me in? Um, what the alarms will do is it will allow that if any of those doors open, um, the alarm goes off. Um, we know immediately that, you know, it's been, been broached for whatever reason and we can go to the cameras and we can call those kids in and say, hey, you know, we're really trying to work on the security issue. You know, if it happens again, there's going to be some severe um, disciplinary pieces and the word will get out pretty quick and we'll be able to control the traffic flow um, a lot better that way. Um, one key, um, one of the options that we have that would be nice is that if a building has to go into lockdown, um, we have electronic locks on all the doors, um, but the problem is, is we don't have a way of turning one key or pushing a button and locking all the doors, um, the outside doors at once. Um, so part of this would be you get a system in um, with a key that you can turn the key, it'll lock all the outside doors um, automatically, especially if it's after school hours when those doors are typically open, um, or to be able to unlock them all at once. Um, and one of the last uh, pieces is the little electronic covers that are on the doors for the swipe cards. Um, the problem with them is, is that the door is unlocked. Um, the teachers don't have a way to lock them. Um, so we can swap out all the little covers that will add a button. Um, the electronics is already there in the, in the main part of the door that with the new cover on there, they can just push the button from the inside, the door locks, and they know they're good to go um, if there's an emergency situation. Um, and then the last piece is uh, having one door, at least on each building, outer door that is also accessible by a mechanical key so that if the emergency crews show up and the doors are locked, they can get in. Um, typically what schools do is they'll have what's called a knock box outside somewhere. Um, the police will show up, they'll have a key to the knock box, they'll open it, they'll have things in there like uh, the key to access the building as well as any kind of maps and other information that they may need in case there's an emergency. Uh, but at this point in time, um, short of uh, coming in with a battering ram and knocking the door open, if we're in lockdown mode, they won't be able to get in. Um, so to fix that. So that 85000 would cover all of that as well as uh, training. Um, we've been talking about the ALICE training um, for the staff. Um, and all those pieces will be included in that 85000 uh, when and if it comes up. So probably what I'm going to ask is um, potentially at the next meeting once we have the numbers finalized, um, is the ability for the district to tap into the facilities re reserve fund if we need it. Um, if there's enough money left over in the regular budget at the end of the year prior to July 1st, obviously we use that. But if there's not enough, um, then we would take what we needed from the facilities um, surplus fund. So, um, so those are my pieces on incidentals and financials. And unless there's questions. I was looking at the budget. You got a, um, the, the food services we, we've talked about, but down here with the school wide stuff, is that? If I add all those numbers up, does that equal the food services, or are these all separate in addition to the food services? Uh, you got my packet. They should all add up. So all that is for the school-wide, it's just it's it's breaking down the yeah, food Yeah, Braintree, Brain Brookfield, um, Randolph Elementary, yep. All right, so it's not like $150,000? No. Okay. No, and again, you know, the hope is is that the pattern falls um, out the same way that it has in previous years is it usually grows and then somehow magically by the end <laughs> yeah. of the year it's $5,000 down. But it's um, it's on track, it's following the same pattern so far as it has in previous years. Um, All right. Talk and then the instruction, remedio, I see it says uh, we're under for 42000 or over, I guess. Um, what would that... Uh, Legal services in some cases. We have that higher ed extra education. Contracted right services, uh, to, to, you're talking about? We've got remedial services. So we just, we haven't spent, we still have 108000 dollars
that what it says? It, yeah. it looked like it was. Uh, There's yeah. forty-two thousand down. I think that's is that the driver's ed line? Or am I reading it wrong? Yeah. That's uh. We we can ask the question. My feeling is probably that there are fees collected that haven't been collected yet. Mm. Uh, All right, so we're under. But let me get an, a definitive answer to you that I'll email out in the next two days. Okay. Yeah. Ooh. Sure, Nobody else said budget. I was just wondering uh, for the pre-K stuff you mentioned in your um, the last paragraph that uh, about pre-K. I was wondering kind of what your thoughts were, what uh, where we are and what we what we were planning because you were saying that uh, parents would pay for time beyond those ten hours. And so I know Brent had been talking about it for a while. And so I was just wondering where we are, what, what you're thinking. So one of the, and actually this is coming out of a lot of a lot of the good work that the elementary principals um, have, have been taking a look at. Um, a lot of the questioning about this was trying to, to feel what the budgetary impact would be, or if there would be one, um, if we went along the path. And the ADM piece is important because the higher our enrollments are, Right, the more kind of in a sense, the more money we get to be able to do, do our work from the state. Um, so what we have been talking about, we've been talking about a couple of things. Um, one is a full day preschool, um, so around the clock. Um, we've also been in some discussions with like the YMCA, uh, the, the local rec group for an after school program as well. So the parents have a way of um, you know, dropping the kids off in the morning and having them here till 5, 30, 6 o'clock at night to kind of better match the working hours. Um, the benefits to us for this, especially for the preschool, um, one of them is really kind of focused on the trauma piece, is the trauma typically happens in the home. Um, for the students that we've got that have severe emotional disabilities. The more we can remove the students from those homes and put them in a place where they are working um, with kind and caring adults, the better off those students are going to fare you know, across the whole 12 years of their, their, their educational life. Um, the other piece is it allows us to have early, early kind of access to these students um, to be able to identify if there are disabilities and be able to begin working with those students earlier um, on terms of accommodations if they need them so that they hit the ground running in kindergarten and first grade when the academic work really starts um, with the strategies in place to be able to access that curriculum the way that they should. Um, and plus for some students that are just a little bit nervous and anxious, um, it's a good opportunity for the parents to get to know the school, um, for the students to get to know the school, be familiar with it, and kind of walk in the door. Part of that transition process are, you know, on everybody and everything um, and where to go. Um, plus the, the, the step up in terms of um, the academics overall with the students. Um, so there's a lot, lot of reasons to look at it. Um, part of the discussion is with the decreased enrollments that have been happening around the state and here is that it'll provide the possibility of and we haven't talked too much about this, and Elijah wasn't there for the discussion today because he's at an EAS con uh, conference. The possibility of moving the six grades out of the elementary schools and into the middle school where it typically belongs. I mean, there's a reason that, that sixth, seventh, and eighth grade are, are usually together because of the developmental level of those students. And it would allow for the preschool to take up space within the, element, within the elementary schools and have them be you know, pre, pre through five. Um, our possibilities it doesn't have to happen with some of the discussions um, that we've been talking about it um, and so we would end up with an overall increase in enrollment right we get the sixth graders up to up to the high school we open up space at the the elementaries we bring in students for the, the preschool and now our ADM our, our total enrollment is up um, and then there's also the piece that I talked a little bit about with with Jeff is that a lot of the students that are um, with especially the severe emotional disabilities um, if they're out getting services elsewhere and then they come in, it may take a year, year and a half to reestablish the therapeutic environment for those students so that they can progress again. Um, so those are all, it's all in discussion. It's not a, you know, not, not a done deal, but it's, it's, it's talk. Would the cost be comparable to what parents pay for daycare now for the three to five? Could potentially be free. And that's why the discussion is so important about, um, you know, what the, what because the, the, the emotional trauma you speak of too is often isn't there a correlation with that and socioeconomic status in which case students yeah. wouldn't be able to, if parents can't afford to pay for it but if it could be yeah. subsidized yeah, and we, we also talked about the, the possibility I mean we, we were hoping 
you know, it's it's um, a short amount of time to get it done, but we were hoping to at least have a part part of it up and running next year. Um, we did uh, reach out. Um, we did the applications, uh, the preschool applications with the state. We were accepted. Um, so we've got a lot of the groundwork um, that's already been done. But what we're trying to figure out now is, you know, how big of this can we integrate next year? Um, the discussion today, it looks like it's kind of a three-year plan to potentially get things all the way to where we, we potentially would like to see them go. Um, but I think the I think the service to the community, and I think that early jump start for the kids um, is going to be incredibly powerful. Um, we also had done a little bit of discussion uh, about the possibility of creating a Raven style uh, program for elementary students. Raven works with our moderate to severe um, disabled students. Um, it keeps them here in a very solid, very powerful program. Um, you know, it still costs more than the, the regular students, but it's significantly less than sending the students out to like a Washington County mental health for 110 to 150,000 a year. You know, we're paying about 27. Um, but the benefit if we had it at the elementary school is we've got the students here. It's a continuous environment. The therapeutic environment would be incredibly powerful. Um, those aren't kids we typically send down, but we can really focus in ourselves in the environment the kids are going to be experiencing on helping them get through those disabilities, get the strategies, um, you know, incorporate them, ingrain them themselves so the kids can use them so that by the time they get to the high school, they can go into the regular high school or, or when they get old enough, go into the, the tech program rather than ending up in the Raven program. Because what's happening now is it's kind of like a pipeline. You know, there's some students that go out and they can tell already what's going to happen is um, by the time, you know, they get ready to go over to the high school and the, the middle school level, they already know they're going to be in, the, in, uh, in EVA or Washington, you know, so county mental health. So if we can get the, the good work done here so that that doesn't happen, we'll be much better off. Not that those programs aren't effective, but we're not getting the re return that we'd like. Um, and that's not a, not a criticism of them. But these are some, some kids that need some significant work. Um, but we think we could potentially do a better job of it. So my only thought, question, concern yeah. is that currently um, zero to five, so preschool <clears throat> registered and licensed daycare centers, um, parents get child care subsidies to help them pay for those programs. So if we were offering a program that wasn't free, would they qualify, would the school qualify for the subsidies to help the parents pay? My understanding so at this point is, is yes. We, that discussion came up with, uh, with Pat last week. Because uh, it would be the same negative would be that only certain families would be able to do that as opposed yeah. to having it. And then that's and that is and that is not the goal. Yeah. Okay. The goal is to be inclusive of everybody. Okay. Yeah. I think essentially, really, with our ten-hour-a-week right now preschool program, what is pre-K program, what has happened is that only parents who are able to drop their kids off and have pick them up, and so we already have a high-end clientele at our yep. pre-K program, which is exactly what we don't want to do. Yeah. Right, you know, those kids already have many of the advantages. What we want is to get kids who could use the structure and, you know, and, and that, teaching and training. And that preschool would exist at all three schools. Well, that would be terrific. That's what we're, I mean, we're talking about. My daughter did the pre K program, and I wish she had a hard time integrating into kindergarten because there were all of a sudden more students, whereas her preschool class was much smaller. Yeah. And, like, as you pointed out, parents who had the ability to be able to pick up their child in the middle yeah. of the day. Right. Well, part, part of the discussion was, was that, and that was the idea why it's got to be across the street. School has to have its own. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what the discussion has been. Mm -hmm. uh, which kind of happens. Yeah. I think it would be really valuable. Um, the idea of taking our sixth graders and putting them in our middle school, I think, is something that needs to be very carefully decided yep. with public input because I know my reaction hearing this um, yeah. and it's based on my parental experience I would be extremely concerned I think that there is such a sea change of 
not just the requirements on the, ch on the child and what a huge transition it is for a seventh grader, yeah. um, but I truly feel until we get a good handle on our climate issues in our middle school and our high school, I would be loath to bring younger children into the middle school environment um, because I just think that that it, it's a dramatic shift in terms of even though they're in a different hallway than the high schoolers or whatever, yeah. it is um, they're exposed to language that they have not been exposed to that hasn't been tolerated in the elementary schools, behavior, et cetera, et cetera. That's a pretty radical change, yeah. and I think that's something that really needs to be very carefully vetted before yeah. it's implemented. Yeah, like I said, we're just we're throwing out ideas. We're thinking our way through what's possible, what might not. You know, what what would accommodate things, um, and so we're very, in terms of, of wanting the the full day preschool and the after school program, we're committed to that. Um, in terms of what the overall structure is, these are, I'm just letting you know in the conversations that are happening at this point in time. Yep. Plus, some of it depends too on what happens with enrollment. Um, you know, uh, our hope is, is that a lot of the work that we're doing to kind of attract um, students from other districts under school choice is going to pay some dividends, especially with the buses and whatnot around, and that'll shift, you know, where the where the physical spaces are open in the schools to, to be able to put in programming. When will we know if we, what sort of results we've had from our outreach? Oh, it's tough to say. I mean, they've had quite a few students that have been coming in for, um, for tours, um, individual during the day, which is actually kind of neat to see. And they're getting students from schools they haven't seen them before, um, which has been kind of nice. But typically, you don't get solid numbers on anything until October 1st. Okay. Uh, that would be what I would say, because then, then you know what your own population is, is doing. Um, they're settled in, plus, plus the, the people that may be coming in from the outside. Anything else you want to add? I had a question on the uh, <clears throat> community safety survey. Mm -hmm. uh, is uh, was that shared out through this? I'm just looking for uh, communication and outreach around that. Uh, so that when it was pulled together um, shortly after the Florida shooting, um, part of it is is when you're taking a look at, at changing security protocols, um, changing structures, physical structures to help with security, is you want to make sure that it meshes in with kind of the community norms, mm -hmm. right? You don't want to go really extreme if the community feels that, I've had some communities where they would feel that if, if you had a little bit too much, it's constantly reminding the kids that they're in danger when, you know, these events are really rare and vice versa. Um, so it went out, um, it's up on the website, and then the principals, and of course remember the snow days, it's kind of messed things up in the vacation, will be getting out um, communications home in the backpack as reminders. And we're also thinking to kind of wrap things up of me doing an actual uh, voice communication through the That'd be great. Emergency system. I was going to say, yeah, because yeah. at least at the elementary school level, I, I don't think yeah. word has gotten out yet around yeah. that. And with the... Um, yeah, but a lot, a lot, a lot of what, what uh, got in the way of getting the, because usually a lot of the, the schools will send stuff home in the backpack because we don't have a better means of communication until April 1st. Um, we've got a, a system that will be coming, coming online on April, April 1st to help out with that. Um, it's just been the disjointed nature of the, the days lately. Sure. So. Uh, um, just noting the date it says on here that that'll 16th. be available through the 16th. Yeah, we can always extend it. As I say, if, if you could, yeah. I think that would probably yeah. behoove us to try to get that. Can you the, the social media pages? Uh, they've been putting them up. Um, they are up on the Facebook okay. accounts at the elementary schools. Um, we've been having some discussion. Uh, we're taking a look at a, a listserv system coming in in April that will be able to email stuff out instantly to everybody, including attachments. Um, and part of it is uh, the, the piece of whether or not we want to start getting people to start not using the Facebook and rely more on the website, rely more on... I'm guilty. Yeah. No, fa Facebook, there's, a, there's not a problem with it, but we've had some things that have gone on that needed to be communicated that just would be a good fit for the medium. Yeah, there's some, some stuff that's delicate that, you know, mm -hmm. might not be the best, best way. Same thing with the voice communications. That's the tough part when stuff comes up is, you know, we really want to get the message out, but is 
this particular message and through uh, Blackboard Connect, is this through the appropriate medium to do this? See, because that is an alert system, I don't know if you want to mix the two. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the fact that it's just a survey. Well, what ended, what, what ended up happening at uh, like Marblehead is they used it for everything, so people would get like four phone calls a night from the different schools if they had multiple kids, so they just wouldn't listen to them. Oh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I never used the, the voice system at Marblehead. It was always emails unless it was a true emergency, and then because when people got that message, it's like, oh, crap, you know, yeah. he never does this. Yeah. So. I, I think to the, whatever extent it's possible that even flyers home, at least at the elementary yeah, school. I saw it the, in the parent newsletter, but I've seen it a couple different places, and I'm not. Yeah, it was not in the Brookfield one, and I. Yeah. I'll, I'll talk week. with Dave. I might be wrong. I know I've seen it like three places, well, but I'm between Facebook and then our emails and. I, but you guys are hitting it's on right there on the website. hitting on the piece of work, and we don't have a good communication. If, if, if you go to the website, and I think you yeah. know, like yeah. you were saying, you know, it's just people aren't with, used to it right yeah, now. Yeah, and with day-to-day yeah. -day stuff. Uh, since we're talking about the website, can we get the school calendar reposted on that? Because this has those half-day uh, in service. Okay. And so, did you put it up last week? Didn't you? The new, yeah, the new, um, one. the new one. Do you mean the current one or the new one? The one on the website right now is from. March of 27. It, it says last updated March 20, 2017. It hasn't been changed to what I'm looking we at. We only right put here. them out once this a year. Once it's finalized. This is next year's. Oh. It's the only thing that's oh, not on there is the updates that they added. Okay. Well, then can we can we change <laughs> the school calendar that's on the website today because it does not have. The additional days for oh for this current right and yep. so it's not accurate and gotcha I looked at it the other day because I can remember what that half day was they were gonna have the, the yeah see those were done after the calendar was yeah. done yeah so we just need to have Ben throw the new one up there from, well from I got to revise it first okay. <laughs> um, either that or we can do, we could probably do kind of a listing of the, the half days again. I actually have a message that I sent that I can pull. I can see if I can find that tomorrow. Yeah, just type it in on the right. Yeah, these are the yeah. half days from this year. Perfect. All right, are we ready to move on to the staff appreciation? Mm -hmm. Paul, you want to? Yep. Yeah. So I plan on. Uh, probably tomorrow or the next day this week anyway emailing um, the RTCC and um, making sure that they're ready to put something together for us and then uh, oh, so background um, every year we send out um, platters to the faculty and staff at each school and um, the platters it's usually like cheese and crackers and vegetables and stuff but uh, it's up to the culinary arts. They, if they have time, they can make something else. But um, we, every year, it's just on behalf of the board to to them, um, saying thank you. So I'll be emailing, sending an email out to get it ready, and he's usually pretty good. Gets it back in time. I assume the numbers haven't changed much. It will be, if I Probably use the same numbers from last year, they'll, yeah. they'll be alright. Yeah, pretty close. Anyway. We decide. We usually do something for the bus drivers as well. Yep. The we did garage. last year. Yeah, yep. that's right. I think that was a nice addition. Yeah, that's great. Are we doing central office? Yep, we did central office last year, right? Mm -hmm. I think. Yep. 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 I think I had the bus drivers, central office, and then each of the schools. Yeah. I, think I can well. verify the numbers for you if you want. The what? Meet me staff as well. Yes. Yep. Okay. Everyone. If somebody hasn't been included, that'd be nice to know. I don't know. We skip bus drivers one year. Yeah, I don't think we did last year. No, we didn't. Cookies? Are you unhealthy? No comment. Especially not on tape, right? Yeah, he's on live TV here. Should be on YouTube. All right, so next year up again for board evaluation. Yeah, it was filling it out. Um, I would say, so we do an evaluation every day, uh, every time we have a meeting. So one being we failed, two being unacceptable, three being acceptable, four being commendable, and five being uh, met our best expectations. I would say going down, um, everything was probably four as in commendable, except for the meeting was well attended, so that'd be a five, I think, because everybody's here. I don't think anybody's missing. And in the back, I didn't get the book yet. 
Oh, we picked a side? Yeah, it's one or the other. All right, then I'll do the uh, general meeting behavior. But this one's about <laughs> governance principles, so I would imagine oh, we do both. I just do both. think I pick a side. All right. I want to be the we'll star. Do both sides. Do both sides. I'm good, I'm good. I'll, I'll pick a <laughs> side. We did well. Oh, dear. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we have one other incidental, which is um, we talked about recognizing Angelo in the in front of the legislature. How are we doing with that? And have you? Okay. We needed to get some biographical yeah, information. Yeah, I hope he's not watching right now. <laughs> uh, um, he's not watching. <laughs> That's the same. I don't. All right. Who does have? Who would be a good person to get some information? Legislature wanted a little bit of information I, to I saw that email. I just didn't yes. have any information myself that was concrete. Um, I'll go, oh, I'll figure that out within the next two days. It's, it's going to be a legislative, um, what do they call it? To recognize him. To recognize no, him. No, because no, well, no, it's a surprise. Okay, okay. that's what I think. <laughs> 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 no? Yes, right. yes, we do not want um, to So maybe email. you could call Karen. I was going to say, what about his wife? I should call yeah. Karen. I call Karen and just make sure that, you know, I've said, you know, I've got all these, but I've got these. I just want to make sure that I have the right information. Can you answer these questions for me? Just do you have time to do that in the next few days? Oh, yeah. I just have to remember to do it. Okay. So put it right in my calendar right now. <laughs> that would be great because they're sort of waiting on us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll we'll get that. Yeah. There was a, um, a person responsible for that. I can dig through my emails. I'll, I've got it on my desk. To you, if you um, that um, who, who sort of collects all that information actually writes up the resolution. That's great. So if I can look for that. Yeah, I've got it on my desk. I can let Ann know. Okay, could you yeah. get that to yep. us? That'd be good. Thank you. The, the other thing was, um, I thought it would be nice since we didn't, since I didn't have time to prep anything before his last meeting. But we, um, I was thinking about just uh, having a little, you know, some drinks and you know, refreshments or something at my house, just as a small gathering to thank him. Um, but didn't know if anyone else had any thoughts about that. And then um, normally, what we do for outgoing um, board members is we either get a book that we, you know, donate in their honor to the libraries and, you know, the schools or, um, you know, we, we have some kind of ceremonial gift or something to help recognize. And he, you know, had been on the board for so, for decades, so yeah. I just didn't know if anyone had any specific idea about it or should we um, look back in the annals of what we've done in the past. <laughs> These, used to have like a hierarchy. I remember Linda sort of, I mean, Laura Sorry's used to be like, well, they've been on the board for five years or less, so it's a book in the library. Yeah. And then it was, you know, they've been on the board for more than 10 years. It's, I don't remember what I it's, thought we gave Laura some sort of, like, did we give her a certificate for a restaurant or something like that? We, we um, got her a, um, a watercolor painting okay. and had it framed and gave her the gift certificate. How frame? Go to high school diploma. I'm serious. From uh, RUHS. After 32 years, you graduate. <laughs> <laughs> After all your kids. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. I think it's fun. So maybe we could. We can certainly talk about. Um, I can look at that artist's paintings and see if there's something else. It was not expensive. It was very, very modest in price. So I think I spent 30 bucks on it and then we had the frame gift certificate. You want me to do a little dabbling? Maybe I'll come up with something and get you guys to authorize it. That'd be great. Okay. That's great. Thank you for doing that. Yes. That's great. And so will you just let us know, Anne, when that's been done? I'll reply to the email. Okay. And I'm putting Karen's email in my reminders. I have to remind her reminders, so actually. All right, so agenda items for next meeting. We've got the auditors um, report is going to meet with us. 
We have a report card report that must be with the administrators. Um, facilities plan update, the community events report on Kevin Terrell, and approved professional staff contracts. All right. So now we have an executive session. Excuse our guests. <laughs>